Episode 2 of the Torque Factor Podcast is here, and I'm your host, Scott Brown. This is a place where we discuss all things moving the automotive service industry forward, focusing on expanding knowledge and awareness around tools, equipment, education, and industry trends. Today's featured guest is Paul Baltusas, who possesses intimate knowledge of OBD. Paul and I will take a deep dive into Ford's variable valve timing errors, mode 6, and cylinder-to-cylinder air-fuel ratio and balance diagnostics. And my great friend and colleague Steve Ford, who has some interesting ideas and thoughts on how to tune up the pipeline of tomorrow's technicians. This episode is brought to you in part by VehicleServicePros.com is a trusted online resource for vehicle service and repair information, fleet maintenance management, and the latest products for servicing America's fleet of vehicles. It is the official website of Professional Tool and Equipment News, Fleet Maintenance, and Professional Distributor Magazines. VehicleServicePros.com is on the pulse of the industry, sharing new technology, the latest product information, and market trends to keep our readers in the know-how. That brings us to our recall segment. First recall we have is affecting 2018 to 2019 Nissan light vehicles. Recall number 19 V as in Victor-654. It covers approximately 1.2 million vehicles. The safety system involves the backup camera or rear visibility system because of a non-compliance with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards 111. Basically, what's happening here is that the user controls can allow the system to be configured in a way that prevents the rear camera view from automatically appearing when the vehicle's shift selector is placed in reverse. Owner notifications began uh, going out in November of 2019. The Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 111 requires that all vehicles manufactured from May 1st, 2018 to default the rear camera view on at the beginning of each backing event, regardless of any modifications the vehicle operator may have previously selected. As always, it's a good idea to run the VIN number through the NHTSA website when vehicles pass through your facility. Next up is recall number 20-Victor-012. This affects Toyota Lexus vehicles. Manufactured from August 1st, 2018 through January 31st, 2019. And this potentially affects 700,000 vehicles. The issue is with failure of the in-tank electric fuel pump manufactured by Denso. In the documents that I've read thus far, Denso Engineering has discovered that the fuel pump impeller is deforming slash swelling due to excess fuel absorption. With the deformation, the impellers crack, which leads to the pump failure. As of January 7, 2020, there have been just under 2,600 warranty claims related to fuel pump failures. Toyota is working on a remedy and will begin contacting vehicle owners by March 13, 2020. Next up is a case study from Diagnostic Network, and you'll find all the information in the show notes. This is a vehicle that came into my shop, 2003 Chevrolet Corvette. Customer complaint was that the headlights uh, were on and staggered. The uh, turn signal indicators were on solid. Uh, And so we went through the vehicle, scanned uh, all the modules, found multiple DTCs and multiple modules, a lot of network communication codes, uh, some uh, electrical system malfunctioning codes. So we decided to focus on the complaint. And when we went to the service information, we read up on how the headlights operate. And uh, we found power and ground explanations and found that G102 is a a primary ground. So I wanted to look at the wiring diagram to take a look and see if any of these other things had any relationship to G102 uh, related to those DTCs. And what I found is that G102 is connected to a splice pack that has numerous circuits, including headlight doors, uh, cooling fans, uh, AC compressor clutch, other lighting systems. So uh, went to the service information to find out where G102 is located, and we found it on top of the uh, right uh, frame rail just behind the headlight, 
and uh, you could see that the nut was a, a little, looked like it was a little corroded. So we connected a voltmeter from battery negative to uh, back probing that actual ground circuit. And with everything powered up and operating, we were able to wiggle it and see a voltage differential of about three volts at times. So we knew we had a voltage drop. Took it apart, cleaned all the connections, put some star washers on it, reassembled, cleared all the codes, re-enabled everything, and ran the voltage drop test, and we got it down to, to nothing, basically. So I hope this case study is helpful in folks understanding how important voltage drop testing is. That brings us to our featured guest, Mr. Paul Baltusis. He and I sat down and had a long conversation about diagnostics. So let's have a listen. You've been with Ford Motor Company for 38 years, and you recently retired. And uh, you're now running a, uh, a company called OBD Advisor. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. And so tell me a little bit about what you're, uh, what you're doing. You, you don't have to disclose who you're working for, but you know, what, are, what are you actually doing, and uh, are you having fun doing it? Yeah, well, I'm basically doing the same thing I was doing before at Ford, but I don't have to do it uh, five days a week, and I don't have as much pressure doing it. So I'm still uh, still working with uh, industry people doing OBD requirements for engineers or interpreting regs for engineers or you know going over car presentations before people go see them, those kind of things. And uh, I'm glad glad to be able to help out some companies that need that uh, expertise. Well, that's great. I, I I can anticipate them receiving a ton of uh, assistance from you, you know, having uh, well-rounded and seeing how things work um, because uh, this is a complicated space, you know, where uh, these vehicles, uh, they're squeezing more and more out of them uh, all the time, and uh, they, they want everything, right? They want high efficiency, and they want low tailpipe emissions, and and uh, which which really raises the bar, uh, especially on the folks at, at the engineering level. So and good guys, not good diagnostics, by the way. Yeah, and that is one of the things I want to talk about uh, is on the diagnostic end. Um, you know, I was looking. Uh, I, I'm also working on doing some research. We've had uh, in my shop here. You know, we've we've seen quite a few vehicles over the years with uh, a lot of variable valve timing. Uh, type uh, deficiencies and, and a lot of it I would say is uh, induced uh, due to lack of maintenance uh, people not changing oil right or or on the right intervals or not actually using the right oils uh, but one of the things that uh, that we like to do um, on cars is, is you know we, we try to pull a health check and do a full scan on the vehicle and and one of the, the features there is mode 6 and um, looking at mode 6 Six and pulling that data on some of these vehicles, I think that uh, some can take that data and and do a little prognost prognostics on that by looking at the the values and look and comparing them to the uh, the min max values that's that's allowed. And and is that an accurate statement? Well, that that is what. Mode six is designed to do. It's the you know it's it's the answer that the monitor provides against whatever the the min max thresholds are. I um, mean the, the difficulty with using mode six is that without a lot of background information, you don't know if it's a if it's a linear kind of thing or or if it's not linear. Uh, for example, catalyst monitor tends to be nonlinear, so everything looks good, 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 and all of a sudden it goes goes bad quite quite quickly. Uh, there's you know there's other mode six data that I think is is very useful. I, I think people have always found the, the mode six data from this fire to be very useful because it gives you you know gives you real time counts of misfires and you can you can look and see how they come and go on, on various cylinders. So I think it depends quite a bit on the monitor how useful the information is. Um, and without necessarily a whole lot of engineering explanation it may in fact be difficult to interpret but uh, as that is not to say that it can't be useful for people that have seen enough of it over the years to make some sense out of it 
Okay. Yeah. So, so on, on to my, the variable valve timing, that's, that's one that I was really trying to focus on to try to understand what, uh, what I'm actually looking at. And I was looking at a 2012, uh, model year and I was looking at the, uh, the OBD operational summary that, that, that Ford provides for free for anybody, uh, out there on their website. And, and I think I can probably think we, we can thank you for probably pushing that initiative. Cause I know that you were, actually responsible for doing a lot of the editing or setting up the framework for those documents and uh, very very good useful information but in s- at some level there's some that uh, some of that data is a little um, out there as far as uh, for the non-engineer type and so one of the things that I was reading is uh, that it, when they had the, uh, they described the typical VCT monitor malfunction threshold. They basically, you know, they're looking for open or short in the in the driver circuit, but they're also looking for misalignment um, or error, target error, response target error, and that's the part that I wanted to talk about a little bit about here. So, you know, they had, they describe it here as VCT over advanced variance too high, and then they go on to say the range is 40 to 700 degrees square. And so that's the part I'm thinking, what what in the heck is 40 to 700 degrees squared? So <laughs> what can you explain on that? Okay, so the VCT timing is, is it's a variance. It's looking at, um, you know, it's looking at VCT error. So the, the control system always has some target for the cam, either the intake or the exhaust or both or whatever. And then the way the controller works is uh, it looks at an error term. It calculates an error and it tries to to catch up. It tries to, to, to get the error to be zero. So if you're looking at, and basically if you have any kind of a closed-loop control system, you can kind of use the error term as an OBD diagnostic. That's, uh, that's what you do on variable cam timing fuel. You know, fuel delivery is kind of the same thing. Uh, adaptive fuel does the same thing. You've got a closed loop controller that, that tries to learn errors, and if the error gets too big, you know, you you, you turn on the mill for for fuel monitor. So, so this is is really no different. Now, the problem with simply looking at an error term in degrees. So, if I'm asking for a certain amount of advance, and I'm you know I'm missing it by ten degrees or or five degrees or whatever. It, that system's always, it's dynamic, it's always working. So there's always some error in it, and you don't want a diagnostic that simply accumulates error. Because right? if, if you had a little bit of error going on all the time, which you're always going to have in, in that type of a system, eventually the error is going to add up to a large number, and you're going to turn on the mill. So one technique for for dealing with that is, is looking at the variance and the way you, you look at that is, is you square it. And when you square the, the error term, you get a couple of benefits from it. First of all, you can look at an absolute value when you square it, the, you know, the negative and the positive numbers cancel out because squared numbers always become positive. So it doesn't, it doesn't really care which side the error is occurring. And then the other thing is that it, it takes small errors and kind of minimizes them and it takes large errors and it accentuates them. So if you, if you can think about if I had a 0.1 degree error, 0.1 times 0.1 is even a smaller number. But if I had a 10 degree error, 10 times 10 is, is a hundred. So, so you can kind of, you can kind of see how that works in, in a system like this. that's always got error. And it stops you from accumulating errors over the long time. And it basically allows you to quickly count up large errors and minimize small errors. So does that, that kind of make sense? Oh, it does. Okay. Now, now that I've heard it from an expert, yeah, it does, it does make sense. And so, you know, one of the things you're, you're looking at the mode six data, that's, that's awesome. Looking at the tool, um, on the scan tool part, you can pull up the, uh, the error PID that does the, uh, the, the desired minus the actual, and it kind of gives you a, it gives you, you can go to the histogram mode, which I found very useful in watching that error chase itself and then ultimately come to come back to zero. So understanding now that that is a closed loop 
it's like a PID controller, right? It's trying to find out where what it needs to do to get to where it, where it wants to be. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. Yep. That's okay. Exactly right. Yeah. So okay. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So that definitely helps a lot. So, um, but when you pull that up and you look at the error, so you're seeing what the recent error was, or will it will it say that um, if you're looking at the the mode six data and you see like 0.7 in one cell and you see 1.4 in another cell is that telling you that it's 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 average error is 1.4 degrees okay so so the vct monitor is kind of an interesting monitor the way the carb regulations read is that you're supposed to look at target error and flow response those are the two criteria that you use but in in real life those are kind of interchangeable. I mean, when when you induce an error, I mean, a, a target error is just a really, really slow response if you want to look at it that way because everything's dynamic. So as you're driving along, the, the cam timing's always changing, and there's really no such thing as a, as a long-term error because your target's going to change every time you accelerate or tip out or whatever. So you know, from a control system standpoint, it, it's always just looking at error, even though the CARB regulation says I want to find target error and I want to find slow response. So what happens is when you induce these errors, it depends on how you drive the car, how much error you're going to get. So you have to make a determination at some point in time that, that says I've exercised the system enough such that if I had an error, I would have found it by now. And that's that's just when, that's a determination of when the monitor completes. You know, so for, so for some monitors like Catalyst Monitor, it's real easy to know when the monitor completes. You, you know, you collect enough data to decide if the Catalyst is good or bad. And when you collect that data, you know, you, you get a determination at the end of that that says, yep, it was good or nope, it wasn't. So for for these type of monitors that continuously monitor, you have to make that determination on the fly based on some criteria. So you know, Ford's got some criteria that says, I've done enough monitoring. I've seen enough uh, requested cam excursions. So you kind of sum up, you know, the, the excursions that the that, that cam's been asked to do over time. And if you've done enough of them, then you can say at the end of that time period that I've either passed or failed the monitor. So when you pass or fail the monitor, that's when the mode six data is written. Okay. Now that monitor just keeps on, it keeps on monitoring, mm -hmm. but you got to make some artificial determination from a carb standpoint, from a mode six standpoint, you've got to make this determination that the monitor completed. So it's, it's, it's kind of artificial. It's, it's the answer at the time you decided that the monitor was either good or bad, and that's what's stored in, in mode six. Now, you, you could make another determination later, you know, because that monitor continues, uh, and that's exactly what happens on, on cold starts and, and hot restarts, for example. The, the monitoring technique during a cold start is exactly the same as the monitoring technique on a, you know, on a stabilized hot drive. Uh, because we have to find things that affect cold start emission reduction, there's actually different time constants that, that the monitor uses. It finds errors faster during the cold start uh, when the cold start strategy is operational. Uh, and the, the reason, and, and there's actually different DTCs that you set, even though the, the monitoring software is actually the same. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same software. It just basically has different different thresholds on the cold start and and the hot stabilized part. Yeah. Yeah. So the tight the cold start, of course, is a, is a shorter period of time, and and they've really got to get that right. So that's why there's tighter tighter restrictions on that monitor. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And you'll set different DTCs and in, in carb. Carb has that in the regulations because they don't want a cold start DTC clearing on a you know, on a hot stabilized drive. So, so in other words, you know, your your oil viscosity is high and your cams don't react the way they're supposed to in the cold start. But then after everything warms up, it acts fine. Mm -hmm. 
So, so the reason CARB wants different DTCs and the reason we have different monitors and such is so that it, it doesn't clear, a cold start fault doesn't clear itself when the, when the vehicle is hot. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it works kind of like similar conditions. Mm-hmm. Does for fuel monitor and misfire, but it's just CARB, CARB says to use different DTCs and it achieves the same, same kind of purpose. Okay. Yeah. And that, I think that's a good thing because, uh, you know, if, if folks are using the wrong oils, uh, that could definitely show up in a cold start and, and go away on a hot start. So, you know, that's, that's yep, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one of the other, uh, one of the other monitors I, I wanted to also ask about is one that was, I don't know what, when it came about, but maybe you can tell me, uh, the air fuel ratio imbalance. So from what I understand, they're looking for an air fuel ratio imbalance between cylinders. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. And can you tell me when, when did that monitor get introduced and, um, mandated? Uh, I don't remember the exact year. Um, it was in the, I want to say it was kind of like in the twenty. 2011, 2012 kind of time frame, but don't don't quote sure. me on that. No, no I, worries. I, I, I could look it up, but it's in that it's, it's in that time frame. Uh, Carb had done some in use uh, vehicle studies, and they had found some vehicles that failed emissions and didn't have a mill on, and they set out to to figure out why that was. And some of the reasons for that, the root cause for some of those failures, was an air fuel ratio imbalance. And that occurs in several ways. Uh, common, a common method back then was uh, people used to use ported EGR. So, for example, I know the, the 4.9 liter old truck engine from way back had uh, ported EGR. So, so rather than some central place where you introduce EGR, there was an EGR uh, introduction port in each uh, going to each cylinder. And what happens over time is that when those ports plug up, you get uneven EGR distribution. I know, I know in four nine, um, the controller control the overall EGR flow to all six cylinders, but you could get an imbalance. You could you could provide too much EGR for one cylinder versus the rest. If, for example, one of the ports was plugged up. So the total EGR flow is correct, but it's not equally balanced between all the cylinders. And what that used to do was cause misfires. And, you know, if it got bad enough, it would cause misfires. But it would cause air fuel ratio control problems. That was one thing that kind of drove that regulatory change is they, you know, they found this issue with EGR. They found they found other issues. But that, that was one of them that, that drove this this monitor. So they, you know, they added the monitor requirement. So you have to monitor for air fuel ratio imbalance, and it was due to some in use testing that they had done and found these faults. And are they able to run that uh, that air fuel ratio imbalance function with narrow band sensors or only on wide band sensor equipped vehicles? Well, I know. Ford has gone to all wide band ratio O2s. Uh, there's there's different monitoring techniques. It's it's a very it's a very difficult monitor, quite frankly. Uh, I believe that FCA and Ford use a, a uh, O2 sensor noise kind of a monitor, and that was actually what CARB had recommended in their uh, initial statement of reasons when they did the regulatory rulemaking. So essentially what, what you do is you look at the O2 sensor signal and uh, a sensor that's seeing in balance will see kind of an erratic signal. So you sample it quickly and you look for the delta changes between that, you know, the, the samples. And if you've got a smooth O2 sensor waveform, it's kind of, it's, you know, smooth and predictable, but a, an O2 sensor waveform that has imbalances, are gonna, it's going to have an erratic signal. So that you know the Ford Ford algorithm looks for large delta changes between O2 sensor samples, and it uses that as an indication of an air fuel ratio imbalance. I mean, there's a lot more to the signal processing than that, but uh, that's the essential theory of, of how you find it. So yeah, it's looking for the hash, hashy or noise yeah. on that uh, actual sensor. Okay. Yeah, awesome. a lot of people call it O2 sensor hash, but it's it's basically it's the noise in the in the signal. 
thank you, Paul, for uh, for putting up with me and uh, joining me on this call. And uh, I hope to talk to you soon. Okay, no problem. Thanks very much. Okay, that brings us to our education segment. And we're picking back up on a conversation I had with uh, my great friend and colleague, Steve Ford, about solutions for connecting with the next generation and a number of outside-the-box ideas. So have a listen. I think the issue is going to be more, what does the, what does the Z, X, millennial, whatever generation really connect with? And, and if we really get inside of their, their thoughts and their space, we start to see the gap that they have between their world and our world is partially, I think, the reality that they don't want to know what we want to tell them to do. That's almost something of an allergic reaction for them right now. And it always has been. We call it, we called it the generation gap in the seventies and you, you know, right. And it was question authority and, and you're part of the, you're part of the, uh, uh, the government or you're part of the institution or part of the system, you know, and that was the hippie era, if you will. Well, I mean, I'm jumping back to that only to illustrate it was very visible back then that it was the dropout Woodstock you know, uh, smoke pot. And now that becomes legal, you know, times change or whatever, you know, how we have this progression, but we're in a different reality is my major bullet point. We're in a different reality and it's not our reality. It's their reality. And I think I might be sounding edgy, but I don't mean to be sounding edgy as much as just pinning this point down. Point one, the greatest thought I could conceive is that it's not about us. It's about them. So if we go to, you know, if we go to their space right now, where they're living, they are living in social media and their interests are largely driven by somewhat of a counterculture. Uh, they want, you know, my daughter's 19. She wants me to use a paper straw. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and their vigilance toward eliminating plastic straws is because number one, they've been educated about the sustainability of the planet and the insanity of using plastics without checking in to how we're going to deal with the disposal of plastics and therefore recycling. So they're fully embracing that. So as an example, until they buy into a value that we share with them as a, as a wise trajectory of the future, they are establishing their own rules and their own priorities that are in often cases defiant to what we're thinking about. So for example, one of the people I interviewed when I first interviewed you for motor magazine, uh, uh, I think it was a, um, a gentleman, Jose Anaya, who's an instructor at El Camino College in Southern California in the Los Angeles area, he said that they we have to be on their value system. And when he went to um, SpaceX, you know, the uh, uh, Elon Musk mm-hmm. company, I think yes. it's SpaceX, right? Yep. SpaceX. And talked to a kid there. He had a transformational experience. When this kid, this young guy, or you know, it was a young, young, young gentleman, said to Jose Anaya, uh, when Jose said, what makes you excited to work at SpaceX? The, the young man said to him, well, we're a, we're a two planet species. And that's what drives our whole vision here at SpaceX. And he said that was transformational. When he told me that it was transformational for me too, because it's mind boggling to get inside the perspective of say a 19 year old youth or 20 year old, who's looking at a viewpoint of a overarching mission that is beyond the awareness of most, most people in society. So if I pull that back to youth today with curiosity and cars, the, the automobile is not being presented to youth in the way that Jose was alluding to when he added more later. He pointed out that, among other things, that the automobile, and he and others whom I interviewed, and you were a part of that, that sweep of people, what I got back was, Correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, if you, you or others who would listen to this, if this is relevant to them, to fit in. He pointed out, and others pointed out, the automobile not only has been an obstacle in our, in our ecology and it's a challenge for the, the globe, um, but it's also been you know, not always welcomed by people who want walking and, and other forms of transportation that are not as, not as you know, heated in debate as automobiles for all their negative things. But when we reframe the car into 2020, 2025, and 2030, the car can actually become part of the part of the grid that supports any city with with sustainable zero zero pollution uh, solutions. So, for example, if the regenerative braking of a car can have ample energy storage beyond the commuter usage of that vehicle, it becomes a source of powering the grid overnight 
when it goes into the grid and downloads, if you will, or, or mm-hmm. uploads its right. excess energy. And suddenly kids seeing that might realize, wait a minute, I could not only drive guilt-free, but I could end up sending benefit to my community when I plug in at night. Well, that kind of transformational viewpoint is what youth today doesn't envision necessarily. But when I've talked to kids at high schools I've spoken to as a volunteer speaker for our industry to motivate them and enlighten them about our industry, they they say that you know to the extent that they're excited about working in the industry, it's because they are looking at being a part of helping make the automobile the best it can be in the 21st century. Well, that would drive our current 20th century approach to be, yeah, we need to weave messaging into the audiences today in our national campaigns to let you know that cars are cool and they're going to be better in the future years. Well, that still doesn't bridge the gap between that message and where does a kid get on, on, on this train? Where do they go on the board? Which brings me to my second point. The first point would be we need to really move ourselves into their value base and their priorities. And their priorities are immune to our our messaging, our advertising, our speeches, our campaigns, unless we get to them on another level, which is the second level, not in a second priority, but probably an equal priority. We need people across the nation, like you and me and everybody who's like us, to move from forming committees into taking immediate action in any ways we can in our communities. So now that's always, and I shouldn't say always, the 20th century approach that I've heard too many times, and I, I value but I think it's a it's a it's an it, it's an incomplete approach. We've said join your local advisory committee at your local high school. Well, that's that's too little, too late. I'm not saying it's wrong to do. It's absolutely we should have been doing it from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. We wouldn't have lost all the auto programs we've lost. I trust you might agree. You know right, that right. that wouldn't have happened if we, if we were. It's like a pilot. You were on autopilot. You know, of course you're going to hit the mountain. Mm-hmm. I mean, at some point. You know, you didn't check your calibration and you trusted autopilot. Well, that's the world is not on autopilot. And and I know it's sounding sort of, you know, uh, like a stump speech, but I'm sorry. Change is inevitable and we need to be there at the table. And when education policymakers made decisions, we weren't at the table. Well, now the auto industry is not at the table unless we go beyond advisory councils. Showing up for a pizza dinner, looking over the curriculum and saying you need to include more about, you know, diagnostics and using lab scopes and throw out your teaching about float levels and carburetors. That's terrific. But that's moving at a snail's pace. We need to move at the speed of electrons with these with the audiences, which means in the number two position, we have to go from, yeah, Scott. Scott Brown's got a point. We probably should go and talk to our local school, you know, but do they get up and do it? You know, yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm just, a, yeah. So I think the first point is we need to get to 21st century ideas. If, if they sound crazy, let's, let's talk to the people who are coming up with ideas that are, that are plausible, but different than repeating the same old thing. Another top 10 program, you know, a troubleshooting contest, uh, top student, give an award to them, you know, let them come, let them job shadow your automotive parts store or your, your shop. Those are fabulous steps. They are a hundred percent worthy, but we need about four times the energy or five times the energy behind those steps to, to enable the youth to really know that cliche quote, but it's a darn good quote. The young people are people in general. Don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that just can ring sort of cliche. But if we stop and think about it, what's going on with young people today is, and I'm a dad and so are you, you know, I think what I get back from my kids is, oh yeah, but you know, you people, you're another generation and we don't even trust you anymore. You know, and they don't, I, I don't want to say my kids don't trust me, but you know, when I talk about anything about our viewpoints, you know, um, as a, as a parent, they want to know that I really have a foundation on what I'm saying. And I think when they know that I care and I tell them, look, I'm not from your generation, but I wouldn't give you this time. I wouldn't give you this attention if I didn't want to give you the best information I can. You get to make the decision. I want to help you make the best decision. I don't think we're informing and motivating youth by telling them what we think they should do. I think we have to Im- Im- impress them with how we want to meet them in, in the actual physical environments that they're in. And I don't think we have. I, don't, I think we tried. I think uh, ASC Education Alliance, for example, based on AES, started at, has started to try to embrace meeting high schools right where they're at to help them right where they're at, you know, to, to build that program. But 
ASC Alliance has one representative typically for each state, or they have one representative covering three or four states or five states. To me, nothing about nothing negative about ASC. It's ASC's best effort to be great uh, uh, custodians of nonprofit funds that are contributed from the automakers. But I think you know where I'm going if I said in point one, we need new ways of thinking to be embraced so that people realize it's not going to be done by committee. It's going to be done by the people individually on the committee when they leave that room, not coming back with an agenda that goes on for two years about what are we, what are you getting you know, ready to do and so on. Second point, again, to tie that down would be we need, we need people to uh, understand that it is, it is not a crisis enough yet to have people jump when they see an opportunity. But from my viewpoint, Scott, I think you, you would know my heart on this. It's a passion because I recognize that unless we help others realize, of course, it's not a visible crisis yet today at the level that people have said it's going to become because people are moving a little bit and they're comfortable moving a little bit. My concern is for every one person that's moving today, I think we need three more tomorrow, not next month, not next year, because the speed of the decline of the available auto instructors, the available auto programs, the available funding for public education, were beyond the finger pointing of, you know, education shouldn't have closed shops. I certainly would want to agree with that. But I think people thought they were doing uh, evidently the right thing. Somehow they were led to believe in order for global competitiveness, we need to increase emphasis on math and academics. And that cuts down on available time for electives. Well, electives are where kids use crayons and blocks and build nothing and draw nothing but what they want to draw until they decide now they're experimenting with this stuff and they turn into a specific thing they want to build or a specific thing they want to draw. But they have to start with the crayons. And you know what I mean on that. It's the mm-hmm. idea of experimentation. Yeah. We're not giving kids that. So, so I say so point two would be we start coming into car shows. We start going to um, car clubs. We start taking the people who are involved in the car culture and connecting them with the auto industry, whether it's dealerships, independent shops, what have you. I think those two points would lead to a third, which is we ultimately have to have some collaboration among ourselves with the other skilled trades. And that would look like, hey, we're, we're all in this competing with each other, just as you would do back when we had, um, what was that dear man you and I talked about, Jack Heiler, you know, yeah. who was old wrench. Yep. You know, with the SAE Service Technician Society and Mark Warren and all those things we've laughed about, you know, with the, with the great networks. Jack Heiler's view was that we are, we are allied with all the skilled trades and we are the automotive group. But I think at this point, Scott and I would wind it down with this third point. I think that our greatest power right now is in not some, you know, political move or some, edgy kind of anything, but rather a wonderful celebration like you and I are talking about, about how cool it is to understand that technology and be interested in it. The automotive career at its best for a technician is not a job. It never has been. But for maybe, you know, 40 to 60 or 80% out, out there, it might be a job. But it, even those people who show up and look at it as a job and aren't doing anything interested in cars, you know, interesting in cars uh, outside of their work hours, they are still inspired and educated and encouraged by those A1 level technicians who are probably not A1 level technicians if they did not have a genuine curiosity and passion. And that passion comes from the inside out, like Dick Goldstrand showing up at your doorstep because he believed you might be a guy who could solve problems that he was dry. He was either driving or taking a train from 25 miles away to find you because he didn't just want your technical knowledge. He needed your work ethic and your ability to be a person who says, we're going to solve this problem. I'm not going to let it go. I'm not happy until we get this problem solved. That's not a job. That's a passion. So my, uh, my thought on that is we have allied plumbers, pipe fitters, welders, CNC machinists, uh, precision manufacturing technicians, prototype makers, HVAC technicians, and you know what I mean. The list continues. And I think we need to help I, I just submit this to you. I'm giving you my, my, if we executed all three of these together with others, it wouldn't be meeting to me. It would be meeting to take, uh, take away next steps that we would be doing. And I would say, for example, 
I'm going to go call the plumbers union or, or, or the plumbers, you know, the town or put out a, a memo or something somehow to get others to join us and us join them because we need to get kids, however, whatever form this takes in a non 20th century model, we need to get to the kids and have whether they're like, like Home Depot has a once a month Saturday morning where the kids are working with hammers and nails and paint and wood. Well, that's Home Depot's action. Um, Lowe's, Lowe's departments, you know, Lowe's hardware stores does uh, Saturday clinics for adult DIYers. The, I, I mentioned that and I'll, I'll close on this point. Those kinds of initiatives are beautiful incremental steps that organizations and companies are taking. It seems to me not out of guilt, not out of pressure uh, to be putting this message out with you, but rather off, off love and compassion for youth that these kids do, need, do not know what they do not know that they're missing. And we have inadvertently removed it from there. That we've taken away the billboards. We've taken away the on-ramps of shop classes in middle school and high school. And we have, we have regret about the fact that it happened, but that it happened is creating a chasm in competence across our nation that I think threatens the very viability of our, of our entire nation. And I know that that, runs on the political side, but I don't mean it as that. I mean it more as the, the kids deserve better from us. Right. And we're selling them, you know, merchandise, you know, tennis shoes and clothing and video games. And we're making billions off them and their parents. Um, but we're giving we're giving them up. Right. And I know that's definitely sort of a stump speech statement, but I think we're giving them up and we don't need to. I, I know, you know, I don't, go out and feel like I'm doing anything spectacular experimenting with going to cars and coffees and things like this. But I kind of feel like, Hey, if I'm going to go blab about how we should do something, I should be out there doing something. And that's what I can tell you with, with, with not confidence, but with, with genuineness is what I'm doing. And I would say that to you and others that, you know, I don't have the solution, but I'm, but I'm doing what I can today trusting that there are others like you and, and people like us out there in the industry who, given the opportunity, take the same approach would say, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think going to my advisory council once every three months or six months or once, whenever that happens at a school is, is enough anymore because we need to, there's, there's, there's going to be dozens of ways to help. But let me, let me uh, with those three points offered to wind down completely, the fact that LAUSD had 85 programs in, 80, in 1985 that were auto programs in 100 schools, and now they have seven and had trouble getting instructors for two this semester to the point where they had to open for the first two or three weeks with, non -seat, with non-technical substitute teachers who were taking role and asking the students to read the textbooks. That is in Los Angeles, California in 2019. If I told you that in 1985, you would say, I've been reading, you know, um, Ray Bradbury, uh, The Martian Chronicles too many times. You know, it's too, too bizarre to think in Los Angeles, California, with, with the incredible reliance on individual automobile transportation, we have gotten to the point where we only have five viable auto programs with two desperate substitutes waiting for the administrators to be able to find somebody to teach the class. We've shut off the pipe to develop auto teachers. And so even if we succeed, here's the kicker in the close, the ultimate close. Even if we succeed with all these 12 or 15 committees across the country right now, with all the associations and nonprofits that are, that are promoting our industry, I think the scariest thing I can say that makes me want people, want people to move is even if we succeed, we, d we do not have preparation right now for the second wave. And I don't know if other people are missing this. If we get all the people interested, we don't have the ability to even respond to them right now unless we get a mobilization of people across the country who are going to be jumping out of their shops and making phone calls to their schools and making phone calls to each other, not to join a committee, but to join a program of reaching out to youth and doing a Saturday program or doing a weeknight program or some kind of an after-school volunteer program that might have stipends or might have contributing components from all the OEMs and the aftermarket companies in a massive movement that, that unfolds in 2020, not in 2023 or 2025. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and so thank you for uh, that, that huge download there. So um, you, you had a number of points there to, uh, 
to touch on and of course we're gonna have to uh we can expand on on those but yeah it's uh it it is absolutely amazing that uh, we've we've been this this change has all occurred without anybody really um awake yeah. at the wheel um a couple right. things right. that you said there you know the the counterculture yeah uh, they're they're just basically there's a disconnect there right and and right. you can look at all the reasons why but um we can look at all the reasons why but what did we learn from that? How do we, <laughs> how do we, how do we counter yeah. that? But one of the questions I did have that, that came up, you said that the gentleman that, that uh, went to work for SpaceX, he said, we are a two planet species. Uh, a two planet species. Yeah. Yeah. So explain that uh, a little further. Well, it's, it's mind boggling and it has never left me. It's probably the most profound point I heard in, in quotes. You, you had some great quotes about what the technician in the future should have a suite, you know, a, a technology suite around that individual and be supported like a surgeon, you know, in the mm -hmm. future. I mean, an right. ideal world. And, you know, so that's fine. That's mind boggling to me, but it's totally uh, realistic because of what we're, what we opened this conversation talking about with ADAS with regard to the, the, uh, the SpaceX student and this great instructor and administrator, Jose Anaya, who has a heart for the kids and the teaching, the fact that he retained that as an anecdotal thing to tell me about was an incredible gift because it's never left my mind that uh, that the youth of today have the ability to be um, to, to marvel about their role that is so critical, and they are recognizing a desperation in their own in their own ranks and in their ages. Um, of wanting to look, look at, at the realities of the earth and international relations and society and gender and culture and all these things that are being debated. At the end of the day, the question for humanity is, you know, there's always that, that ominous concern about what if and what if we don't and what have you. Well, to give these people a passion to get space exploration or space travel to move forward just to explore Mars, I think what's powerful of what Jose and I quoted that student saying is that that student had a ready, clarified one sentence mission that said to the to the, the listener, now you with me, we are a two planet species, is clearly saying, as I understood it, because Jose didn't expand on it, I don't think he needed to, and I respect your asking, but I wasn't there, so I'm only extrapolating from the comment that what that SpaceX team has in, ingrained in their employee psyche is a mission that is not limited by showing up for work each day. It is driven by a realization that in order for us to do that, if we're ever going to be a, a two-planet species, in order for us to get there, we have to first take into consideration the reality that if we don't solve things on this planet, we may need to be on another planet in order for humanity to survive, which is a pretty heavy, ominous thing to think. But on the flip side, the exciting side of that is I get it that the student didn't say that to Jose with Jose quoting it to say, oh, you know, we have a miserable future, you know, and we're stuck and we're desperately looking for a way to get to another planet. No. I think what came across was that wild, wonderful view of imagination saying we need new solutions that are in that are paradigm shifting beyond what most people are doing. We're sleepwalking on Earth if we don't think maybe we'd need another planet. And it gives us hope to even even envision shooting for that in the distant future. If we just look at trying to solve problems with the same mindset, we're going to be limited. So I think Elon Musk, you know, and all of the drama and, and highs and lows and, and, and media coverage of what he does, you know, his imagination has, has been positively impacting young people at SpaceX to get them to think about big, big solutions that are so far beyond our typical conversations day to day that as I give you this quote, you'll be likely to quote it to another person. And I think that student knew. That student was basically saying, we live in a reality that is boundless. And that was my great friend and colleague, Steve Ford. If you have any questions for Steve, please submit them to us. We look forward to having him on the show in the future.
Okay, we're talking about upcoming training events for 2020. Max, the Mobile Air Conditioning Society, has their annual conference and trade show coming up in Nashville, Tennessee, February 19th through 22nd, 2020. For more info, visit macsw.org. The annual Vision High Tech Training and Export is in Overland Park, Kansas, just outside of Kansas City, and this year will be March 5th through the 8th. More information can be found on visionkc.com. The TST Big Event, Technician Service Training, is coming up in Terrytown, New York, March 21st, 2020. More information can be found at tstseminars.org. And ASA Northwest has the Automotive Training Expo coming up on March 27th through the 29th, 2020, in Seattle. And for more information, visit ATETrainingExpo.com. Hello, Newman. And we'd love to field some of your questions, so please consider emailing us, podcasts at VehicleServicePros.com. Now that brings us to the end of the show, and we hope we're able to bring you some quality content and look forward to future episodes. And we're looking for your feedback, so if you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the mailbag. And please hit the subscribe button to receive notifications on future episodes. Thanks for joining us.